In 1953, the DPRK, China, and the United States signed the Korean Armistice Agreement, marking the end of the brutal Korean War. Without the signature of the Republic of Korea, what does the agreement mean for the complex situation on the Korean Peninsula today? China once made the greatest sacrifice fighting alongside the DPRK during the Korean War and helping achieve the Armistice Agreement. With the current unpredictability of the DPRK regime, is China as supportive as it was six decades ago? Since taking office, President Moon of the ROK has expressed his willingness to open peace negotiations with the North. Is there opportunity for him to upgrade the current armistice agreement into a permanent peace settlement? In addition to Moon's call for negotiation, China and Russia have urged a suspension for suspension proposal, suggesting the DPRK stop its weapons tests and the US-ROK alliance cease military exercises at the same time. Could this be the approach to end tensions on the peninsula? The Korean Armistice Agreement, signed in 1953 between DPRK, China and the United States, ended the brutal Korean War, the first of its kind. Very bloody regional conflict since the end of the Second World War, but brought only a truce rather than a true security framework to the region. The divided Korean Peninsula still faces many complex challenges and dangers. At the G20 in Berlin, South Korean President Moon Jae-in's proposal for a Korean Peninsula peace initiative was criticized both at home and abroad, surprisingly. And China and Russia's joint declaration supported a suspension for suspension proposal and strongly opposed the DPRK's nuclear and missile program and THAAD deployment in South Korea. Additionally, Russia has suggested it has its own roadmap for peace negotiations. To discuss these issues and more, I'm happy to be joined in the Beijing studio by Yang Xiyu, Senior Fellow of the China Institute of International Studies, and Anna Tangan, author and col columnist, as well as commentator. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Yang Rei. I wish William Shakespeare were in the position of the moderator for tonight's live show about the 64th anniversary. She, he will ask a question about to be or not to be, make or break. Today we are here to commemorate, if not to reveal, the 60th anniversary of the truth, the ceasefire between the two Koreas. In theory, don't you think the two Koreas are still at war? Uh, yes, technically and legally speaking, uh, the two Koreas remains under state of war simply because the armistice uh, strike in 1953 uh, is uh, not uh, a legal peace arrangement. Even within the armistice, the articles uh, uh, instructed uh, in the indicated that all the war parties should uh, turn to the peace negotiations for peace treaty. But because of the Cold War reason, they failed, and we failed to continue to the peace negotiation. So that issue is unsolved till now. That's why uh, many people argue, including me, say the Korean Peninsula remains under the state of war. However, the two sides is separated by the most heavily mined area in the world, the DMZ, mm -hmm. demilitarized zone. Do you think that particular zone has separated the two sides from going to war again? Or do you think it is, after all, something like uh, the armistice framework that has uh, worked very well so far, but it remains pretty fragile. What's your take? Well, l let's look at the realities. You have 9,000 to 11,000 pieces of artillery that are aimed at one quarter of South Korea's population uh, and their capital. So from that perspective, uh, any kind of uh, action would be mutual destruction. In terms of the actual boundary, it's still a hotbed. We are entering a period when quite clearly the storm clouds of war are approaching and it's unfortunate it seems like a slow motion train wreck but i'm afraid the south korea must have been held hostage by a thousand pieces of artillery from the northern side given the fact that the, they refused to respond uh, angrily for example after soldiers and civilians were killed in the yanping island uh, when the submarine was sunk both were viewed as pre pretty provocative and mm -hmm. the two uh, events of crisis um, uh, allegedly must have been triggered by the DPRK and yet South Korea 
exercise the utmost restraint without turning to war. Do you think this is unfortunately the fact that uh, South Korea has been the most reluctant to go to war because the city of Seoul comes under easy uh, artillery fire from the DPRK? Well, actually, uh, you have touched on a very sensitive topic between the two Koreas. In fact, the peace during the past uh, several decades were built not by the legal arrangement, not by a uh, uh, true peace engagement between two Koreas, but by the mutual uh, deterrence. Oh, balance of terror. Oh, yeah, balance of terror and the peace of terror. The peace. Uh, peace of yeah, terror. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Peace of terror and the peace based on the balance of terror. Mm -hmm. uh, you are right. Uh, South Korea is indeed hate to be in war because of the consequences, especially the consequences on Seoul. By the way, what's the population of Seoul? Uh, about 25 million. Uh, in, yeah. in greater area. What's the percentage of the total population? Uh, six, uh, uh, more than 60, uh, 60, uh, 60 million. Uh, in but the what's total? the percentage of well, it, roughly it, it, say 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 about one third a quarter quarter, 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 quarter of quarter. the total population live in the city of Seoul. That yeah. they live within they, something. They, they live within the artillery uh, range. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and uh, by the same token, actually North Korea also has lived in the state of terror, and uh, the consequence of the war is also unaffordable for North Korea. That is why for several, several times it was North Korea that withdrew from the very dangerous brink of the war. For example, you mentioned the Yanping Island. At the first time, uh, North Korea shelled on the Yanping Island and uh, the then President Lee Min Park said, okay, I would do, I would do the, uh, the, the, the drill again. And North Korea said, if you do it again, there will be a more terrible strike. And the South Korea did. And North Korea did nothing. They said... Yeah, but that's, uh, that, that's not a rational way of saying that they're not responsible for the initial pirates. They may have pulled back, but it, it, shelling this island to begin with was, it was horrible. This is an act of terrorism. They were simply trying to, you know, subjugate these people and show that they're willing to use armed force to get what they want. I, I, I don't know if I necessarily agree with my <laughs> earnest yeah. colleague well, that uh, they're, I, other they're, than they're showing restraint by bombing in, innocence. Other than the discourse, uh, about the piece of terror or piece based on balance of terror, we, we do see the formidable forward military presence of up to 70,000 of American troops in Northeast Asia, and a lot of them are deployed in the ROK. 28,000. Yes. Right. So do you think the uh, presence of American troops there, according to the Mutual Defense Treaty with ROK, has also served to guarantee the peace, however fragile it has been? Uh, actually, the military presence by the United States on South Korea uh, play a role only for guaranteeing security of South Korea, uh, the so-called deterring uh, uh, North Korea from invading or attacking uh, South Korea. However, such a presence, unilateral presence of the military make the vulnerable balance of the two Koreas even more vulnerable and more dangerous. So that is why we have witnessed a round of round of crisis. Uh, here, here is a big question. Now, no, but I, I want to respond to that point because on one sense, yes, it guarantees uh, the safety of South Korea, but on the other hand, it's a destabilizing force within Asia itself. This is something that China objects to, yep. the idea that there could be more troops there, that a unified uh, uh, Korean peninsula could be, in essence, an arm around China, uh, trying to prevent it from uh, growing economically and politically. So yes, on one hand, it, it, it's, it's a guarantee, on the other hand, it's an impediment. However, if you could still remember how uh, Kim Il-sung, founding father of the DPRK, had crossed the 38th parallel in the wake of the Second World War, some kind of a military presence by the U.S. in the ROK may deter what could have become yet another serious aggression by the DPRK. So why do you think, I mean, the counter-argument is also very convincing, that were it not for the forward military presence of the U.S. government, yet another Korean War may have taken place. Um, of, of course, you would say um, 
other than the factor about security assurance provided by the United States, the DPRK has also uh, established its own homegrown security assurance, for example, nuclear tests, yep. missile tests. Yep. They use such weapons of mass destruction to deter prospective aggression. Yep. This kind of measures on the northern side have also paid off. What do you think of the mutual efforts made by both sides simultaneously? Well, uh, actually, during the past uh, decades, both in the Cold War and uh, post-Cold War area, uh, period, uh, both of the sides, North and the South, the South backed by the United, um, by, by the United States, keep uh, building up their military capabilities. And uh, because of the sudden uh, over of Cold War, the security balance between the two uh, uh, is in uh, terrible uh, unfavor for North Korea. You mean but the end of the Cold War tapes not in favor of the DPRK, no. but the other way around. The ROK benefits a lot from uh, what is left of the Cold War. Therefore, uh, yes. is that the reason why the DPRK decided to go nuclear? Yes, that's one of the reasons. The major reason is uh, they want to correct the rebalance of the security situation. You know, during the Cold War, there, are, uh, there were two trilateral blocks, you mm -hmm. know, North Korea backed by the China and the Soviet. Remember, at that time, the Soviet, uh, North Korea, China, North Korea had uh, treaties, right? And uh, South Korea backed by the United States, plus Japan. And uh, suddenly, the Soviets was gone. Mm -hmm. And uh, China normalized relations with South Korea. That means the trilateral for North Korea was gone. But the other part, the trilateral remain there and even stronger and strengthened further. So such an imbalance really make a terrible imbalance of security for North Korea. So that is why they want to make a, a nuclear deterrence to rebalance the situation. Mm -hmm. But the truth is their desire to have this nuclear rebalance is actually going to be the end of it. There is no way that the United States will allow a country that routinely says that it's willing to bomb America, that there's a final solution with a nuclear warhead, with a nuclear warhead but the issue is whether the DPRK possesses the ability to project the nuclear warheads which must be militarized in we, the first place. Do they have the ability to project that? They do have the intercontinental ballistic missiles but the accuracy is, is at stake I'm afraid. Okay, I, I, I don't know if the situation were involving China and a hostile entity said that we have nuclear war, uh, weapons and we're ready to use them and they're working towards getting it and they said we're going to send them over to you, whether you'd wait until they had pinpoint accuracy to do something. This is the situation from a populist point of view, no president, whether it was Obama or whether it is it's Trump, who will stand by and let North Korea develop a, a nuclear delivery uh, system. Gentlemen, let's take a look at the sense of desperation on the northern side, the DPRK, when the southern iron trap hat is still maintained and consolidated between the United States, Japan, and the ROK through their mutual defense treaty. The northern side, as you said wisely and accurately, collapsed due to the end of the Cold War as well as collapse of the former Soviet Union and our normalization of the relationship with the ROK. It should have been the case that the DPRK should have built a far closer uh, strategic and military relationship with the uh, People's Republic of China. And yet, it goes against the conventional wisdom. It turned to the weapons of mass destruction instead of uh, following our advice by opening up, by rebuilding its uh, poor economy. So what's going on there? We don't know. I mean, many people are wondering aloud why the DPRK decides to turn to army first, the military first, and the nuclear weapons first, instead well, of uh, turning to peaceful reconstruction of its economy. Well, yeah, you're, you're, you know exactly what the reason. Uh, despite Ideological the fact, zealotry? No. Um, despite the, the Family the, dictatorship? despite the long history in which China has come to the aid of North Korea. The fact is there's a long level of distrust. The 70,000 troops who fought in the anti-Japanese war along with uh, the Chinese troops when they returned were not treated very well. In fact, they were ruthlessly in many cases suppressed because they were seen as a fifth column, some entity that would in essence enforce uh, North Korea directly under uh, China's control. That mistrust trust continues today. Even during the height of this thing, 
uh, Kim Jong Un said, you know, somebody from his uh, government said that these missiles could also reach Beijing. This is an affront. Every time Xi Jinping gets near a microphone where he's going to talk to the international uh, society about uh, fair trade, anything, for some reason, that is a time to fire off a missile. I don't think that Ironically, Beijing has. Ironically,、that. whenever you look at articles and media reports about the、uh, mounting tensions in the Korean Peninsula, China is always portrayed as the only ally of the DPRK. Yes, indeed, we did sign a mutual defense treaty, something like this, in the early 1960s, despite the massive withdrawal of Chinese volunteers from the northern side of the divided Korean Peninsula. What do you think of the effectiveness, if any, that's implied in this?、Uh, Uh, a mutual uh, assistance and cooperation treaty. That is the、uh, version about the peace, mutual defense treaty between PRC and the、yep. DPRK.、Uh, many observers. Are we serious about the、uh, commitment to the defense of the DPRK? Okay, my answer is、uh, complex. Yes, we are indeed serious about the treaty even nowadays. However. Whenever we talk about treaty,、uh, we are still serious about the ambiguity, the policy of no, ambiguity, no, or no. the treaty itself. Actually, if you look at the whole context of treaty,、mm -hmm. it it includes many articles. Whenever we talk about allied relation with North Korea, many people only look at the Article Two. Article about, Two. Yeah, it's、uh, very much like Article Five. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. But the purpose, the nature of the treaty. Was and is designed to maintain the peace. Well, you could call it a policy of ambiguity. You never you say know, you it, use it, it or it, you yeah, give yeah, it up. Okay, if you look at the, the the name, the title of the treaty, friendship and cooperation treaty, something, and the, the article two is only one of the elements or components of the whole treaty. So, by China's logic, whoever、uh, threats the peace. We will use the treaty, including North Korea. If North Korea threatens the peace, threatens the we, peace. Yeah, we will certainly oppose that. That is why, on one hand, we remain in the treaty with North Korea, but on the other hand, we have strongly opposed North Korea's efforts towards the missile and the nuclear weapon, simply because the missile and the nuclear weapon, the mass,、uh, weapon of mass destruction,、uh, is designed to. Instability, even going or sliding into war, so that is why we oppose that.、Uh, in other words, China take position on the peninsula issues not only according to the Article Two, but、uh, according to our purpose, our national interest. You mean the Chinese side has a our own interpretation about Article Two? It not just it does not just refer to any provocations from、uh, the southern. Tripod,、uh, namely the alliance between ROK, Japan, and the United States. It also serves to deter the DPRK. It's a warning against the, their we,、uh, reckless behavior. Okay, even we、uh, focus on the Article Two. We can imagine if North Korea is attacked and invaded by South Korea and the U.S., China will certainly take a strong reaction.、Mm -hmm. However, if that If the scenario is like this, it is North Korea that invaded or attacked the South Korea. China's reaction will be totally different. We cannot uh, uh, implement Article Two, regardless the individual、okay. concrete scenario. Okay, let's put aside、uh, our interpretations about Article Two, the treaty itself,、uh, war and peace. Let's look at something that is very dramatic. In the early 1990s, when Deng Xiaoping decided to normalize our relationship with the ROK, I mean that、yeah. did surprise、yeah. Pyongyang, and that may have served as the game changer in the、uh, current relationship between Beijing and Pyongyang.、Yeah. Pyongyang decided to alienate itself from Beijing even further. The bilateral relationship between Pyongyang and Beijing got very frosty. Yep. And the issue of、uh, mistrust between Pyongyang and Beijing became even worse.、Yeah. So, what was the driving force behind late senior leader Deng Xiaoping's decision to establish our diplomatic relationship with the ROK? Yep, it was a very, very difficult decision facing Deng Xiaoping, facing、mm -hmm. Chinese national、uh, interests, 
And unlike, you may recall, in the early 1990s, China normalized the relation with many countries. Mm -hmm. However, the normalization with ROK is really, really unique. That's not only the bilateral affairs, but the trilateral affairs. Say, before the normalization with ROK, we have a very clear, we had a very clear bilateral relation, a parallel for bilateral relation with both of the Koreas. For, for North Korea, uh, allied relation. For South Korea, enemy relation. When Deng Xiaoping decided to normalize the uh, relation with ROK, that means Deng Xiaoping want to change the, both of the bilateral relations, say, change our enemy relation with ROK into a normal friendship. And the meanwhile, change our traditional allied relation with North Korea into the normal friendship either. So that uh, triggered a dynamics interactions between Pyongyang, Beijing, Pyongyang, Seoul, uh, Beijing, Seoul. Since then, we have got uh, the trilateral uh, interactions, but uh, fundamentally, China's policy towards the whole peninsula began to change, just, just as you mentioned, it's a game changer. China, uh, originally, we uh, deal with the uh, Korean Peninsula affairs in a divided basis, allied relation and enemy relation. Now, we want to set up both normal friendship with both of the Koreas. Now, uh, Anna, I wonder if you agree that Deng Xiaoping decided to establish the relationship with the ROK in an effort to divide the rule, in a sense, he didn't, didn't want to see uh, unity between the three allies, the ROK, Japan, and the United States, by alienating ROK through the normalization of the relationship. The United States would not be able to put the two allies together and target China. So what do you think of this uh, uh, wisdom of Deng Xiaoping? Well, I think Deng was a, a marvelous pragmatist. He, <coughs> he wanted to normalize things and signal to the world that China was not interested in any kind of aggressive outside moves, that it was putting its economics first and things like that. And I think, but also by this period, I think there's a, a real schism that is developing between two nations who started out as communists and you know the growth within china was quite different from that which was happening in the dprk the dprk was increasingly centered around the families it was clear that he was going to pass power on to his son uh, there were real real differences and especially in the economic development area uh, north korea continually failed to follow behind and has continued to fail to follow china's example even when there have been numerous offerings of help and people, a lot of people don't understand it. If you look at a satellite map at nighttime of South Korea and North Korea, you'll see <laughs> South Korea is ablaze with lights and North Korea is almost pitch black. This is not a good uh, you know, situation for this country. Well, what was the immediate response from Seoul back in 1994 when Deng Xiaoping was to uh, move forward with the uh, bold decision to establish a relationship with the ROK. Was it a dramatic uh, surprise from the ROK? Look, they must have been stunned, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, what were their calculations and what were the ROK calculations and considerations in giving a positive response to Beijing's decision? Well, uh, you can imagine uh, the decision made by Deng Xiaoping, made by China, was highly welcomed by, warmly welcomed by South Korea, by all Reasons. But don't forget, the lurking behind the ROK has always been the United States. The yeah. United States uh, may look the other way around. It may not see its allies getting too close to Peking, very much like in the case uh, between Japan and the ROK. It yeah. will be a nightmare yeah. for, t for, for, for Tokyo and Beijing to get closer through either the single currency, the East Asian Monetary Fund, or whatever. But That's we, why Yukio Hatoyama, former Prime Minister of Japan, was kicked out of his office by the United States because this guy called for ouster of American troops from Okinawa. He also called for the uh, Monetary Union, uh, further economic integration between the three major economies, ROK, China, uh, uh, China and Japan. So this guy was not very popular with the, uh, with the White House. And I, and I understand that, but also put this into a different time context. You know, we're talking about a period when chi it's not the China of today that was back then. But it's five years after it's Tiananmen. I mean, the United States w it was still yeah. awash with the bitter memories about that e event. So I just don't know <coughs> why the United States didn't 
prevent ROK from moving forward and accept they, they Deng Xiaoping's no. decision to they, they, they normalize couldn't. the relationship. They, 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 couldn't? they couldn't. You mean as ROK? You said, as you said, it was a warmly received uh, you know, a gesture by yeah. him. It, there was no strings attached. Yeah. The U.S. would have looked horrible if they said, no, you can't be friends with them. That would be something like a, uh, a, you know, a schoolyard bully would say, no, you can't be friends with him because I don't like him. This is not the way you can conduct yourself. If they had pr tried that, it would have been quite different. Now, now, if related to that, a South Korean leader had said, look, we're going to get rid of the 28,000 troops, that would have been a game changer. There would certainly been a very, very strong reaction from Washington. What they would have done, not clear. Let's, uh, let's go back to the Korean War a little bit. Now, uh, thousands of uh, POWs on both sides. Yeah. Um, some of the uh, Chinese uh, uh, POWs uh, opted for going to Taiwan mm -hmm. uh, instead of uh, going back to China, their motherland, because mm -hmm. uh, many of them were POWs in the civil strife. Mm -hmm. uh, they were the former KMT soldiers. Yeah. That didn't come as a surprise. Uh, but what we are talking about here is the decency that the war dead of the Chinese side has have enjoyed. For example, their remains were returned mm -hmm. in a dignified way, with dignity. I mean, uh, the Chinese government may appreciate highly uh, the honorable uh, way and approach that the ROK adopted in returning the remains of the Chinese volunteers, the war dead of the Chinese volunteers. However, I, I've never visited the DPRK, and mm -hmm. after the death of uh, Otto Wambia, I would never ever go there because, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a picture of fears, it's a picture of uh, horror. So, what do you think of uh, the war dead of the Chinese uh, inside the DPRK today? Are they respected? Do the uh, North Koreans pay tribute to the war dead who made their unconditional, unselfish com uh, uh, sacrifice to safeguard not only the safety of the ROK but also defend China in the early days of our post reconstruction in the 1950s? Well, uh, the remains uh, uh, inside the uh, DPRK. Uh, uh, have been in respective way by uh, DPRK authorities. However, uh, many of the places uh, burying uh, the remains are reconstructed because of the economic development uh, purposes. It's a really uh, uh, re uh, regret for Chinese, especially those the relatives in China. Uh, but basically, uh, so far, uh, it's okay. Uh, the treatment, the the, the re, uh, treatment of the remains uh, by volunteers, uh, of the volunteers, uh, are basically uh, are basically good. So that's no problem between China and DPRK. And the remains in the South Korea, during the past, that was a very complicated uh, procedure. Say, whenever South Korea collected the remains, want to submit to China, must pass through the North Korea. I see. And uh, finally, we got an agreement between Beijing and Seoul. And now we enjoy the direct, more human being way to arrange and uh, to conduct such uh, passes. So it's uh, good news, uh, not only for those relatives, but also for the whole Chinese people. Yeah, but I, I, I would ask, uh, when was the last time that China was invited to march in the, quote, victory parade that they have on this anniversary each year in the DPRK? That has not happened. There is no ongoing recognition of what China did for the DPRK, and that I would hold is very strange. China has also but, pushed back uh, okay. uh, shipments of coal from the DPRK in an apparent attempt to honor our uh, commitment to the UN security resolution to impose economic sanctions on the DPRK because of the nuclear tests and missile tests. With that, we come to the end of this chapter uh, of our discussion about the 60th anniversary of the truth in the divided Peninsula. I'll see you next time. Goodbye.